hello hello and welcome or welcome back to read becca for another weekly chatty catch up on everything that i've read everything i'm currently reading and everything i'm looking forward to reading with an excellent week of reading this past week and november is nearing the end so i'm pushing to finish up another thing or two for that but let's start with the non-november read so first i finished state tectonics by malka older this is a very shiny library copy it is political thriller with a sci-fi setting and it's in an earth that is future but is still very recognizable as as our world the main technological advancements are a constant feed of information that's very reliable and transparent and meant to be extremely complete uh, and that has enabled a micro democracy so micro democracy here is imagined as every 1000 people make up their own democratic voting block and so they decide what's happening in their neighborhood and who is their representative basically what what political party is going to represent them is going to decide how the basic functions of their their sentinel their thousand people group is going to work and everything about how their area is, is set up and what's legal and not legal is determined by by micro democracy so um through this, I have enjoyed this series so much because of those political elements. And this is the third and final book in the trilogy. Um, I do feel that over the course of this, the series, each of these books does kind of tell its own story. So you get pretty satisfying single book stories. And from a world building perspective, I feel they, they kind of build on each other. But overall, as a, a trilogy, I don't feel like at the end of this book, we really came to a, like a complete conclusion. And I think that's intentional. It's realistic. Malka is bringing perhaps uh, realistic experiences, having worked in NGOs and government, uh, that they are constantly striving to do better in a flawed system. And that's very much where I left feeling <laughs> this, this book. So without spoiling too much, I would say the first book, is really taking a look at an election, a major election. So they have sort of more local elections periodically, but every five years uh, they have the major worldwide election. And that comes with a lot of consequences and, and how people may want to move between Sentinels based on who they support and, and things like that. The, the fallout of it is really significantly impactful, but based on information, capital I information, being the speed that provides them with all of the data they need for their day-to-day -day lives. It's at their fingertips or really their, their eyeballs, their brain. It's, it's in some way ingrained um, technologically for them to have immediate access to anything they want, basically. So as we're going, coming toward this election in book one, we start looking at what happens if somebody is trying to um, manipulate the information that's available to people. And how does that affect the fallout of, of these political decisions? So that's kind of book one. Book two, we are looking more at what happens when there are gaps, holes in the information that's available to people. Um, and how does that affect people's decision making? And then this final book, we're talking more about alternate sources of information. What happens if you have different perspectives on something, even though, you know, you may have absolute recorded information, it may be recorded from different sides and you may get a different story depending on which side you're, you're seeing. So the idea of who provides you information and what are their biases is really key into this story. So I really, really enjoy the themes, the messages and the, the political ideals that are explored throughout these that is very imaginative from the political perspective. Um, so I, I just love that innovation. I love the world building certainly to this. I'm not sure I totally love the character building. For me, I feel that coming through this last book, I more than any point before realized we probably have one to two characters too many whose perspective we are in over the course of the series. If we had cut that down, we could sink into the character a bit more instead of constantly jumping heads. And it feels like we are jumping between characters every three to five pages through a 400 page book. And maybe that is the right choice for a thriller um, or someone who's looking for a really action-packed book. And I get that, but for me, like, I really am more here for the, the politics and exploring that and really getting attached to the characters more is what I wanted. And I just don't feel like we are able to do that because we don't spend very much time with any one given character. Um, so 
I did really enjoy this and I really enjoy the the world building and the politics and the innovation and imagination behind this series and I pretty much will be here for anything Moth Older does basically. Um, I have shared before but I will I will repeat. Uh, Older was involved with um, something that's put on by Arizona University by their Center for Science and Imagination I think. Um, I'll link it. I can't remember off the top of my head but uh, Older was involved with them putting on a sparkle salon on YouTube where a bunch of authors who write science fiction, who also have pro professional careers in STEM and policy making related to that, to talk about this sort of topic, how imagination about science fiction topics can be integrated into the real world, and how we can use that imagination to create change and better our future. And so I, I love that discussion and have shared it before, but I will definitely link it down below so you can check it out. Um, so Older is doing really, really boundary pushing things in this book. I think as a, as a book, it wasn't quite what I was looking for, but yeah, I really, really love the ideas here. So that was that one. And that was finishing a series, which I'm very happy to be doing toward the end of the year. Um, then I read Boku wa Zirigami. This is a children's science book about crayfish. So this was really, really fun. Uh, I was a little surprised at how fun it was. Um, it's one of my favorite parts here. It does talk through uh, crayfish. I love the end papers that are crayfish there. I, I think they look more like lobsters than crayfish on end papers. But it is so creative and silly a bit at times in the writing. So here you can see, if you approach me, jujitsu, pinchers swing up to threaten you. Um, yeah, I thought this was so fun. It was very easy to read. I, I really am happy. I've been working very hard on uh, my, my Japanese. The illustrations or pictures are great. Um, there are There's a whole section about how crayfish take off their shells to get bigger. And this was an exercise in not doing direct, like literal translation because they, it talks about um, at one point, I take off my clothes with my bare hands, is what it says. And so having to do that sort of translation where you're inferring meaning based on context is kind of important. So like you have like a growth chart and everything. It's a really fun little book. So I had a great time with this book <laughs> and enjoyed it very much, even though it was it was really silly. And I think that was a great choice to talk about crayfish. This was difficult in that reading from a, a Japanese perspective. I'm still so far away from being able to actually read the content. Um, like I said, I was able to read a couple of things and that's that's happy. I was able to read through phonetically very easily. So that's progress. But like crayfish is not beginning Japanese. It doesn't really come up in, in any of the lessons that I've had so far. Uh, so that was maybe good. It exposed me to some vocabulary I probably wouldn't have gotten to until much later. And uh, this it, it is both frustrating and, and good because I want to be so much farther along in learning Japanese than I am. Uh, I look, I know about 2,000 or over 2,000 words now, so I'm making really good progress, but it's still daunting how far away I am from actually being even remotely conversational. I'm, I'm so far away, so, so I will be keeping up the children's books for a bit, I think. Um, then I finished one November book as well that I will talk about in my wrap-up for November uh, Monday. I finished Stone Song by Trisha O'Malley, a sort of urban fantasy romance that features modern day Dublin, a sort of major fey element where you've got a quest for a stone from a chosen one who didn't know they were a chosen one, and a romance of course. So that one I will talk about tomorrow and hopefully I will finish something else because I'm reading Holly Jolly Diwali by Sonia Lolly. I've read uh, Matchmaker List from Sonia Lolly before and enjoyed it very much. And this I've been flying through, so I will almost certainly finish this ahead of the end of November. And I also, my uh, nonfiction read is The Idolatry of God by Peter Rollins, and good progress on this. I'm like halfway through. So I think that's everything that I'm actually reading right now. <laughs> that seems like a very light, light pile for the week, but I think I am trying to wrap a lot of things up since I'm going to have to move my books. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm definitely planning to finish Holly Jolly Diwali this weekend and hopefully get on to a, a novella and finish something else before, but I, I'm not sure what yet. So 
I think that's it for books this week. In watching stuff, I don't recall if I talked about Dope Sick. I did finish that. Um, I think that was last week and I just didn't talk about it. But I had kind of wanted to complete the trifecta because Fall of the House of Usher I watched and that's very Sackler family dynasty focused. Um, Painkiller I had watched recently and also enjoyed and now watching Dope Sick. At the time this was the earliest one that, that came out that was kind of an adaptation of the story of the Sackler family and I didn't watch it because it seemed like too hard of a topic at the time it came out. So I've been kind of going back and catching up on all of these shows that are covering that same topic. And this one, unfortunately, I feel like was much less successful than Painkiller. I think Painkiller portrayed the information a lot better, um, like the storytelling aspect of it was much better, the performances were much, much better. And Dope Sick, I don't understand the costuming and hair decisions. So many bad wigs, so, so many. And like, how do you make Rosario Dawson look bad? I don't understand. So a lot of the performances were really rough and you could tell it was not, it can't have been the actors because they, they were good casting decisions, but the actual actors were not up to their potential. So I have to assume that direction was rough on this. And that was led, what led to so much really wooden performance. Um, <clears throat> certainly the uh, Richard Sackler, I can't remember, whichever one is the, the one that was really in charge of things. Um, <clears throat> I did not like him in this, this adaptation as much as Painkiller, which is Ferris Bueller. <laughs> I can't remember his name right now. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen, but he, he did a fantastic job. It was a very, very odd, strange performance, but from what I understand, that's kind of what they're going for as, you know, him being this kind of very strange person. But I think, I think the performance there was like through the roof better. The only one real standout for me was the, the actual doctor, the main doctor in Dope Sick was far and away better than most of the other performances and really stood out as a great, great performance. Um, I'll put him on the screen. I don't remember who it is, but someone you would, you would recognize. So, so that was really fantastic um, in terms of, of the show, the actual um, content of the show, I guess, but in terms of how it was presented, looking at the other shows that I've now watched, it was the weakest for sure. Um, what else did I watch? I have not started in on holiday stuff quite yet. I have watched Great British Bake Off um, and we're up to the finale now. Uh, I have been watching Survivor, oddly, and finished up season two because I jumped way back to the beginning and have started watching from the beginning because I've just been feeling like Survivor. Um, and then I also watched Face Off season four. Um, because again, I was wanting kind of dumb reality shows <laughs> and I, I've been wanting them more so than baking shows for some reason. So weird, but I think we are going to get all of the holiday baking shows coming up soon as well. So I'm sure I will upcoming be diving into mostly holiday baking and holiday romances on shows. Uh, lifey stuff. I went to a concert. Um, Dar Williams was actually here and I think it has a booktube connection because I don't think I ever would have gone or heard about it if I had not talked to Dia from Novel Idea about our liking Dar Williams. She mentioned Dar Williams in a tag at some point, I think. Um, and I was like, I haven't thought about her in a long time. And then I got a targeted ad recently for the fact that she was going to be here. <laughs> and so it was a very odd venue. I was not really a huge fan of it. It's kind of like the maybe jazz style or even comedy show style place where you actually pay for a table. And um, so it was a little bit stuffy and I kind of would have preferred a more of a concert venue, but it was, it was a good, good show. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, I think that is it for now, I guess for upcoming um, and booktube related stuff, I am expecting, I probably will not be having as many videos midweek going out. I will still be trying to do my weekly uh, wrap ups every week through December, but I am going to be horribly busy. So you may or may not get videos in during the week. Otherwise, um, I also don't think I'm going to give you any recommendations because I am currently desperately trying to get caught up on videos on other people's videos watching because vlogmas is looming. Um, and as soon as that happens, we all get slammed with a million videos. And I do actually really enjoy everyone's Vlogmas content. If you, if you have not been around, Vlogmas is over the month of December, people posting a whole lot more. Some people do like 
every week if they if they don't normally. Some people do like a set number, like the 12 days of Christmas, but most people do a video every day up to Christmas in December. And that's a lot of videos, especially if you have a huge subscription list like I do. And I always have a good time enjoying them, but I get so behind. <laughs> so I'm trying to clear the decks so I'm ready going in and I can actually watch a lot of what comes out. So I will be zooming through <laughs> trying to watch people's videos and get caught back up. I'm actually doing really well on watching some of the old, old stuff, like months old that I haven't been getting to in my watch later queue to clear it off. Um, so I'm, I'm much more caught up than I have been for a couple months. Uh, and then the last thing booktubish to talk about is the booktube prize. I am signed up already to be a judge. You can enter either fiction or nonfiction. And I, I am currently open to both, but I, I'm thinking I'm going to choose nonfiction when we actually get there. Uh, however, you, you don't have to have a channel. You can sign up whether you are a commenter or you have your own channel. All you have to be willing to do is commit that you will read six books in two months and turn in your votes on time for ranking those from first to sixth. And so there are four rounds. You don't have to participate in any more than one round if you want to. Um, and you can sign up from now until the end of December, and that is the cutoff. So I will link everything down below in terms of signing up um, and getting involved in the, the BookTube Prize. Um, it has been a great fun time for me every year that I've participated the past two years, and every round I've done has been wildly different. Even judging this year in nonfiction, both the semifinal and final round, wildly different sets of books. So it's really, really broadened my reading horizons to stuff that I wouldn't have normally tried. Um, so that has been great fun. So I heartily recommend if you have any interest of, uh, at all in trying it, you you go ahead and sign up. Um, I think the first action thing that you will have to do is like February, we will probably get a an email with a very long list in the categories or category that you have agreed to judge in with potential options. And so people will rank their, their top 20 out of that, or not rank, they will put forward the 20 that they think should go forward. And out of that, we form the long list for the first round. So you should definitely sign up if you have any interest at all. And as I said, I will link that down below. I think that is it for my bookish week. Um, it's been a very good one and you can't see, but behind my <laughs> tripod, I've got boxes of books already going for taking down the books in my uh, bookshelves that are on the other side of the room. <laughs> and slowly but surely, I already filled four boxes and I only cleared off two and a half shelves. So I have a lot ahead of me to do. Uh, so that will be my afternoon today and likely a little bit more tomorrow of uh, moving books. And um, this one will probably be the last one to go, but it will be a process. I don't even think I have enough boxes yet. So that's it for me today. Thank you all so very much for watching.